talking of model organisms, we'll now move on uh, to the worm, um, or I'm sure you're not going to talk about the worm, John, but to, uh, to Sir, Sir John Salston. Uh, um, Sir John Salston got the Nobel Prize the year after Paul Nurse to add to his PhD from a certain Fenland University. Um, to the public, his fame comes mainly from his inspired leadership of the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, the laboratory that made the biggest contribution to the sequencing of the human genome, and his passionate defense of the open access genome sequence against commercial monopoly. In science, his fame rests as much on the extraordinary achievement of painstakingly tracing the lineage and fate of each of the cells in the embryo of C. elegans. Work, says Andrew Brown, his biographer, that demanded a level of detail and patience that had simply been thought impossible until Selston did it. Ladies and gentlemen, John Selston. In 2007, I visited the Galapagos uh, whilst I, at the same time as reading Darwin's diary and The Origin of Species and, and traveling in his footsteps, I was struck by the freshness and relevance of his writing and, and at the same time was filled with admiration uh, for his enormous abilities as a polymath to, to collate and abstract from such diverse observations. And I, as I read, I learned that after returning to Britain, he interacted with, with many other thinkers, but yet came through with his own personal synthesis. And it was opposed by the establishment of the day, but he had the courage to push it through into public view. But interestingly, as first formulated in the back-to-back -back papers, uh, short papers by Wallace and Darwin, the, the idea was thought pretty unimportant. And it was only in the following year, when, when the fuller account provided by the origin of species came out, that it became compelling. And at that point, it famously attracted uh, Thomas Huxley's accolade of how extremely stupid not to have thought of that. <laughs> and this is a feeling that many of us have from time to time, when after a struggle, we grasp some great insight. It was certainly the case for me in, evol in terms of evolution when I belatedly, because the education of my generation really didn't touch evolution, um, it, but I belatedly came to grips and myself experienced exactly that sense of illumination. It was actually as a postdoc in, in Leslie Orgel's lab in California uh, where we were thinking about the origin of life and I realized uh, that evolution by natural selection is not just the explanation, but is actually the very definition of life. And since then, as Paul has, has been detailing so nicely for you, comparative genomics, that's the, the, the looking at all the DNA from all the organisms as, uh, more and more, more than a century later, has completely independently and orthogonally confirmed that extraordinary insight by laying bare for us that unity of, of all life on the planet. And what Darwin offered as a theory, I think it's very important that we now uh, treat as an established fact, in so far, of course, as any uh, uh, scientific finding is a fact. But we shouldn't really talk about the theory of evolution in any sort of dubious sense anymore, obviously. And reflecting on all this among the islands of the, of the Galapagos brought home to me how, how Darwin had, had liberated us from dogma. He'd brought comprehension to biology and has allowed us to move on philosophically. And as we've heard this morning, evolution explains how it is that we're vulnerable and that individually we're disposable. And, and the thing I always feel uh, is that life walks a tightrope. And much as we understand some of our basic processes, it's still a matter for wonder and astonishment that we or any life forms actually work as a whole. There's much to learn, but of course we shall. Now, we naturally want to fix our own vulnerabilities, but actually the most dangerous ones are not our personal, mental, physical, and health imperfections, but rather our social and economic limitations. Now, as Sarah Hurdy has, has beautifully laid out for you, we can see where the beginnings of our sociability come from, but what happens next? And that's what I want to, 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 to spend the last couple of minutes on. Now, looking back to Darwin, socially, he, he was very much a product of his age and class. He was an advanced humanitarian in, for example, his abolitionist views on, on slavery, 
which some say underlay his drive to demonstrate the relatedness of all human beings. But at the same time, he was effortlessly, smugly indeed, confident, as people were in Britain at that time, in the superiority of his own people. As a scientist, he was and he could afford to be fair and gentle in his dealings with colleagues. And you see, for people of his day, the world seemed pretty ordered and progressive. And actually, it was natural for people to think that evolution by natural selection would continue to take humans forward. But we've now reached a bleaker patch in human history. Notwithstanding some of the false alarms, the prophets of doom from earlier, we really are now coming up against barriers to which simple competitiveness is not a solution. And it's increasingly evident that our only enemy is ourselves. We've come to see in our current transcendent philosophy in the West, at least, that the individual is all important. And that misconception is now holding us back. And we need new economic formulae that by all means encourage us to strive, but yet do not lead us into these excesses of destructive competition. Science itself has become increasingly competitive and is being bought up piecemeal by vested interests, which promote technology as offering solutions to all problems. This is a touching but dangerous face. Now, of course, the future doesn't have to be bleak at all, but there is a pressing need to put our house in order. Scientists could contribute greatly by adopting a more proactive stance in applying discoveries to the collective good rather than the enrichment of the few. But at the moment, the system encourages the opposite. And personal enrichment is presented to young scientists as the only path of good sense and indeed of virtue. We have already trained a whole generation into greed. The free market, a wonderful servant on the small scale, is a dangerous master on the global scale. In short, we should not conflate the increasingly satisfying account of human origins that evolution offers with the need to plan wisely our social and economic arrangements. And this is the difference of how altruism and sociability came into being with what we can now do with what's in here and what's among us in our communication all the time. Planning wisely and knowledge of our past should not be seen in any sense as directing our future because whilst natural selection provides an explanation for our existence, it does not tell us how to behave. We must, face, we must ourselves face up to our responsibility as the transcendently thinking and therefore most powerful organism on earth. Thanks.